So I want to say thank you for everybody for letting me come and talk. This is um, a very, very important topic that I think we all need to be aware of and um, what's going on in our society. I wanted to title my talk today, Florida Mental Health Matters, because we're in the state of Florida. I will be comparing a couple of things to the United States statistics. This is me, board certified in psychiatry, neurology, addiction medicine. I've been in Charlotte County, just a county right above you guys, been there for over 10 years. Basically, my main gig is Paradise Behavioral Health, which I founded. And I just realized we've been practicing and been out in a community for seven years now, totally independent. And then I also am the medical director of Community Behavioral Health. That is a mental health clinic in Cape Coral, and they've also opened up in Miami. Also, I became recently adjunct professor for Lincoln Memorial University School of Osteopathic Medicine. A lot of times my approach really, people ask me if I am an osteopath. I said, no, but it's very interesting and I really appreciate their approach, the integrative approach that this school has taken when it comes to teaching medical students. It's been very exciting for me. As well as, yeah, I work with um, Jennifer at Park Royal Hospital. Um, they call me whenever so often I was there full time. But um, as you can see, I've had way too many things to do instead of just focusing on the hospital. But it's, it's been an enjoyable ride as well as I still really enjoy working at the hospital. I tell people, you know, once in a while it's good to do that because you got to keep up your skills, right? So um, it's just a, something different that I get to do once in a while. All right. So the topic today is about Florida mental health. We're going to break it down. What is the statistics in the U.S.? What is the statistics in Florida? What are the access and what are the barriers to getting mental health care? I'm going to talk specifically unique to Florida. What about the challenges of Hurricane Ian? What are the mental health effects of that? As well as, you know, segue into post-traumatic stress disorder as well as something that would be interesting to know that there is a correlation, a medical reason other than psychiatric reasons, what happens with PTSD and the brain. And what are our treatment options for PTSD as well as other mental health disorders? So when we talk about mental health disorders, this is talking about depression, mood disorders, bipolar disorder, anxiety, in here, you have generalized anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia. That's the most common one that we think of when people are um, quote unquote psychotic, hearing voices, seeing things, feeling paranoid. And then also there's a combination of a disorder, a combination of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia called schizoaffective. So it kind of falls into that. Substance use. Um, we don't normally think of that as a mental health disorder. We think that's more a behavioral, but there's also a biologic basis for it. And then personality disorders. Um, there's also a biologic basis for that, but sometimes um, not a lot of whole uh, treatment at hope, but it does fall under a mental health disorder. Let's talk about um, what's going on with mental health these days. And there is, a, mental health has risen in the United States because of social media. There's talk about just looking at other people's lives. We compare ourselves and we get depressed. But in reality, we all know that's fake because we all just want to present ourselves in the best light. So social media plays a factor in that. COVID is, uh, plays a big factor. That has accelerated mental health issues and as well as the trends in society. We are more nuclear families and then um, people are more isolated. So what happens with all three of those? Isolation, less connection to our community and humans are social animals, social beings. So when you take that away, um, it causes a lot of stress and then rises depression and anxiety. This is a study from the Euro, USS Census Bureau um, Household Pulse Survey in 2023. As you can see, just in two weeks when they did this survey, 
people who reported, adults who reported anxiety and depression, 32% in Florida and pretty much in line with what the United States is showing. However, I mean, that's 30% of society saying that they have mental health issues. Just in Florida alone, this survey called the Florida Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System telephone survey, adults with poor mental health, meaning they're complaining of depression and anxiety. In 2007, it was about 9.7%, so 10% of society. But in 2020, it went up by 12.3%. So it's still a significant statistic to point out that mental health is rising mental health issues. And, but look at this, 2021, 40%. So what happened? COVID, you know, it really did isolate people. And I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more about that, what exactly happened and what factors happened to make that happen. In 2021, you know, a year after COVID, the number of adults reporting depression episodes in the past year, adolescents, 20.1% age 12 to 17 years old, and in adults, 8.3%. I wanted to show this because like, what does that mean? Look at 2010, there's still around 20%. However, it has significantly gone up in Florida. And these are what I would already assume people who met criteria for major depressive disorder. Um, the criteria for major depressive disorder is two weeks of these symptoms. They're feeling sad and hopeless, as well as stopping usual activities. Anhedonia, that is also one of the symptoms. Look where it is now, almost at 35%. So it, it has risen in 10 years by 10%. That's pretty, uh, pretty scary, and we need to know this is happening as an evidence that mental health issues disorders are rising even among our teens. Substance use disorder um, has also risen, but before we talk about um, those statistics, let's talk about the four basic criteria. This is new from the DSM-5. It, it changed a little bit, but um, it is one of the things is impaired control of using alcohol or drugs, physical dependence of alcohol or drugs, social problems, meaning you know, they can't keep a job, they can't keep an eye on their kids, and um, risky behavior, meaning you know, they're using more or using longer than expected, and efforts to try to stop it, cut down, say, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna just only drink this much. It doesn't happen, even though they, the patient may have tried. The pandemic has made things worse. There is an increase in substance use as well as increase in death rates, overdose by substance use. It is the highest in record. 2021, you had 106,000 drug overdose deaths. So that's just a number and we're like, okay, what does that mean? It rose by 51% since the pandemic started. There is an uptick in overdose deaths affecting people of color, even though white people you know, there's still are the majority of it, but people of color is starting to go up as well. So let's look at Florida. What is the statistics of Florida and rising drug overdose deaths? Here, um, the yellow line is um, Florida at 37.4 and the United States is 32.4. So Florida is a little bit above the average in the U.S. In 2011, that number was actually 15.4 per 100,000 overdose deaths. 2021, it went up to 37.5. Compared to the US, it was 13.2 to 32.4 from 2011 to 2021. So, um, you know, Florida is a leader of the rate of overdose death. And the overdose deaths, really the main culprit is the opioids it was accounted for 48% in 2000. As of recent, what is it? It's now accounting for 75%. We have a really bad opioid crisis and I'm gonna show how that's happening because of what changes are being made to the opioids. 
Most of it was uh, prescriptions in the early 2000s. However, you know, with the drug war, they did try to like limit the access of opioids. So people turned to heroin. However, past that, fentanyl. Fentanyl now has become one of the biggest leader sources for opioids. The overdose death rate from opioids did improve from 2017 to 2018. However, the pandemic kind of just like helped that along that is a sharp acceleration mainly because of the fentanyl use and uh, access to more fentanyl. Why is fentanyl um, really, really bad, really, really um, uh, such a higher risk for death from, with its use? It's stronger and um, sometimes people do mix it with others, but um, people don't appreciate that fentanyl is thousand times more powerful than somebody who may have even shot up heroin or opioids. Um, One-time use from somebody who may not even have used any fentanyl or even opioids and didn't even know they got fentanyl has led to an overdose death. It's, it's sad that the public is not aware of that, especially um, kids, and um, that it is much more powerful, much more dangerous than what we knew even as what heroin or even opioids are um, subject to. Okay. In 2021, the drug overdose death rates due to opioids, here it is, 76% was due to opioids in Florida. As in the United States, it was 75%. So kind of almost similar trends. Let's talk about suicides. 2010 and beyond, we have had half a million lives lost due to suicide. It peaked in 2018. It kind of went down right before the pandemic, 2019, 2020. However, it went up again a year after the pandemic. In 2021, the number of adults who reported serious thoughts of suicide in the past year, 4.8% in adults but um, the adolescents, 12.7% of adolescents. And I wanted to focus on adolescents because, you know, these are our future. 2020, suicide was the second leading cause of death among adolescents, age 12 to 17. And in 2021, 22% of high school students seriously considered attempting suicide. Let's talk about the statistics. I didn't want to just gloss over this. Why, why do you think that's happening in our young? What did we do to them during the pandemic? Yeah, yeah, we changed their routine. You know, kids need that routine. We isolated them from their peers and held them at home. Um, this is the time when adolescents are very used to being more social animals because they're trying to figure out who they are and what they want to do with their lives and so forth. And just to um, give them the self-esteem, knowing that they're with their peers and they're happy. We turned them to um, you know, hermits in the home. And I saw it in the, the kids that I treated. Oh, the, the ADHD kids, oh, not good to keep them at home. Um, you know, put them on a screen and uh, trying to get their attention with a teacher on a screen, not good. <laughs> and, and basically that took away also their physical activity. So, um, you know, kids have a lot of energy, especially kids with ADHD, they need to just like wear it out. Um, so they internalize a lot of um, already what they're struggling with and cause depression and anxiety. What, what's interesting to note is that sometimes suicide is not often linked to mental health conditions. Mental health doesn't always play a factor in suicide. In fact, I just read an article last night that said 20% of people who have committed suicide don't even meet criteria for a mental illness. But once they get in there and they get the mental health care, 10% of those people do get diagnosed with it. So um, 
I talk amongst this with my colleagues all the time, you know, because we work in an inpatient unit and everybody's coming in there talking about suicide. And um, among my colleagues, they always say, well, you know, if they really are suicidal, you're not going to tell you. It's true. You know, they'll tell you, like, if they tried it once and they go in the hospital and they say, no, I didn't really mean it, but they really did. You know, people have died in the hospital um, after a suicide attempt because they really did mean it. Or they're trying to say, I didn't mean a dog, you know, and then you let them go and guess what happens. So just remember that. It, this is where us as providers have to really look into the risk factors for suicide. And so these are the things that um, cause people to contemplate suicide or commit suicide. It's multifactorial. Isolation, relationship struggles, financial problems, housing, health problems. Pandemic didn't help it any. Let's talk about relationships. I think one half of the story is you know, a lot of divorces happen, you know, during the pandemic or post pandemic. Why? Because sometimes, you know, you, you, a, a couple, they do need separation. They do need time away from each other. People lost their jobs. So they're struggling trying to keep their house and health problems. It kind of did exacerbate, especially, you know, even with symptoms of COVID. And did we do anything to help them really get healthy? I'm not sure. We all, talk, we all know about long COVID and so forth. Suicide risk is actually growing among the people of color, younger individuals, and rural areas. 55% of suicide is due to firearms. The majority of suicide is due to firearms. So anytime at all, when you do an evaluation on a patient, make sure you ask about access to weapons. And we're talking about mainly firearms because patients say, yeah, I have knives, you know, but just removing even that risk of firearms is a good thing. 7.8% suicide by firearms in Florida compared to 7.5% and other means is much lower. So um, never miss that question as a psych provider. Even if they're not suicidal, you need to know where their risk lies. The mental health workforce, I think that's a lot of it's here. Psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, counselors for mental health, addiction, and marital um, counselors. Unfortunately, Trying to seek mental health care in time is often difficult. Lots of problems with provider shortages, especially people in rural areas. And they became more pronounced in the pandemic because as you can see, there was a sudden surge of mental health issues in the pandemic. Let's talk about some of the barriers to care. What I like to define is unmet need. Unmet need is defined as someone who needs mental health treatment, but can't get it. As you can see in our statistics in Florida, 23.6% of patients are unable to get that compared to the United States. So we're like, all right, we're good. You know, we're, um, we're ahead of the curve here. But there are what makes you most likely prone to having an unmet need and having a barrier, the un uninsured, the underinsured, and I'll explain that, as well as, again, communities of color. So let's say, you know, yeah, we're great that, you know, Florida, we're getting more access to care, but I, I wanted to just like be a little bit of a Debbie Downer here. This was a study, the State of Mental Health in America 2023, does the rankings by states. What they did was they had 15 measures I'm not going to get into it, but there was 15 things that they focused on. Basically, it, it, it incorporated all the ages. What they focus on, focused on is um, prevalence of mental health as well as access to care. If you're in the 1 to 13th ranking, you have lower prevalence of mental illness and higher rates of access to care. Wisconsin is number one. And that kind of surprises me because all I hear about people of Wisconsin is, you know, they love to drink, but maybe they have better access to, you know, substance abuse treatment. And uh, at the bottom of this top year, 
is New Hampshire. Uh, Kentucky, that, that, that's, that was surprising to me. I would think it would be the other way around, but maybe they've done a better job in trying to provide access to people of Kentucky, which is you know, one of the hotbeds of opioid crisis. And if you're in the ranking of the state from 39 to 51, you have a higher prevalence of mental illness and a lower rate of access to care. Starts from Indiana and down to Kansas. That's surprising to me too, but um, yeah, this is, this is what they use to um, score where the state of mental health is in all the states. And this is what I wanted to say that Florida is not in the top, not in the bottom, but we're, we're below, you know, we're 35th. I guess that's better because it used to be, we used to be 49. So we're making some progress. The children, what is the state of their mental health? This is statistics from 2021. For the children receiving mental health care, 11.1% in Florida, 11.2% in the United States. But remember, 20% of children have, are suffering from depression and anxiety in those previous stats, right? So there's still really an unmet need here. There's many children that need mental health help but they don't receive it. Well, one of the things that the pandemic did help though is that they increased telemedicine. So we were, even during the pandemic, we were able to do a lot of this, like some states allowed for other state licensed providers to be able to provide um, mental health care through telemedicine. And this is a wonderful thing, especially for people who are in the rural areas and uh, for people that um, may not have access to somebody so quickly. The other things that has helped is the Parity Act of 2008. It required um, insurance plans to cover mental health and substance abuse service, just as much as medical and surgical services. Um, the Affordable Care Act, you know, it, it springboarded from their parity and they also added that to the law that requires mental health coverage and substance abuse coverage. And they said that this is an essential health benefit. However, I, I always thought it was funny because um, there are still patients that come to see me and they're like, they absolutely have no mental health care doc. I'm like, what do you mean? Because of this, they don't apply it to large group markets. So um, big companies don't even have to still provide that because I have patients that have insurance and they still have to pay cash to see me because of that. They still are not required to cover mental health benefits, some of them, and most do, but there are still health insurance plans out there that they can get away with this, that they don't have to provide it. The percentage of adults with any mental illness had private insurance is, is pretty good. You know, Florida, 50%. Uh, compared to the United States, about 60%. But this is what I'm calling, this is what the problem is when I talk about underinsured. If you look at the out-of-pocket expenses for people who have mental illness, compared to people without mental illness, it's pretty much twice, right? So that's what I mean when I talk about underinsured, their coverage is just not enough when they have mental health issues. In 2021, as reiterated, out-of-pocket costs with people with mental illness was higher than those without mental illness. Florida, 1,300 compared to 692, almost 700, almost half, you know, is the, or twice as much costs out-of-pocket. In the U.S., pretty much almost the same stats. And so this doesn't even include all the things that um, patients are paying for that are not included in their employer coverage. So reiterating again, underinsured. And another scarier thing when it comes to private insurance, adults with mental illness have a higher total healthcare spending. Because as you know, somebody who has a mental illness, they have other medical issues. And so we're, this is a hamster wheel going, what is triggering what? If you have a dire medical problem, you're gonna get depressed, but guess what? Depression itself triggers 
medical issues. So in Florida, total spending for ones with mental illness is 8,800 versus 4,400. So double the price again. Same thing as in the United States. So what is the main cause of this? There, the lack of in-network options really is. I mean, how many of uh, providers are in network? In terms of people who are mental health care providers, especially in the big cities, they have the luxury of charging cash. They don't need that because of the fact that there's such a high need. Um, in 2017 data, they did this study where like 20% of people paying for their insurance are still getting out of network benefits. And unfortunately, if you accept insurance as a provider and the patient wants an option to be out of network, it's basically pennies on a dollar, what the insurance will pay for. So, you know, those providers can just say, you're gonna have to just pay cash. Large companies though, companies that have 200 employees and above, they did see a um, problem, you know, with what's going on with the pandemic. So they did see that there was going to be concerns of needing more mental health care. And they did try to um, help that. They made some changes to their mental health resources and benefits. In 2021, um, they expanded access to mental health and substance abuse services, mainly through telehealth. So this was good for us because a lot of times um, people who opted to do telehealth in our office, they were getting paid, you know, they didn't even have to pay copay. So that was good that they did that. And then 16% um, of these companies have either added EAP or expanded it. And EAP is an employee assistance program, basically getting for free therapy, even um, outside of their insurances. So. Um, the employee does have a right to have so many of those, and there are providers out there in the community that do this. In 2022, they upped it even more. 81% of these companies now offer this employee assistance program. They've also added um, mental health self-care self apps, as well as 61% of these companies added digital content to their wellness program. So they, they've done some things to help and acknowledge that this is a problem. Uh, Medicaid. Medicaid is coverage for low-income Americans. They have the highest rate of mental illness and substance use disorder. So um, they really need a lot of help. And so what are the pros? Basically, none or real, nearly no out-of-pocket expense. So that's good for people who are low-income. And they do have an access to a broad range of mental health and substance use services. The cons are though, limited access to providers. Um, a lot of private um, practices aren't even, and they won't even waste their time with um, getting uh, on the panel for Medicaid because it's not worth it to them, unfortunately, especially with adults. Um, the kids are a little bit better if you're a certain provider and uh, the pandemic, again, because of the high need, delayed access to care. Even if you do have a broad range of treatment, you don't have access to a lot of the treatments that are beyond medications because the statistics of 55% of people have depression, have treatment-resistant depression. So you have to think outside the box but it's not even really outside the box. What are our options aside from medications? Unfortunately, Medicaid patients don't have access to that. And I can talk a little bit about what those treatments are later on at the end of the, uh, my talk. Um, utilization has rebounded, you know, pre-pandemic, but people getting access and using their access to mental health care is still lagging. So I wanted to just um, play this video. I, I, I like it because it, like, it really just reiterates what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. This is a uh, news footage about Hurricane Ian. Not so much about like what happened, but then what, the aftermath of how people are dealing with things. 
In the 30 years of my life, gone. For storm survivors who've lost everything, there is somehow still more to lose. Every time I hear the wind blow and a piece of aluminum, aluminum shift, and it's kind of like your PTSD. For others, grief seems to weigh more than physical debris. It's like a death of a loved one. You know, it's just like it, the, the pain just comes and goes. Research from the World Health Organization suggests between one third and a half of those directly exposed to natural disasters will develop mental distress. And a 2020 study from the University of Delaware found the suicide rate following hurricanes jumped 26% in the year following the storm. Mental health normally has such a stigma. Beth Hatch is CEO of National Alliance on Mental Health in Collier County and says Ian's devastation did not discriminate. Many, many are in desperate need um, to rebuild their lives back. And we need to be there for them because all the, these are such triggers. The state of Florida is setting up support centers and the federal government has a 24 hour helpline to connect people with crisis counselors. People don't really know where to begin. We need that handholding, you know, to help pe get people through that process. Some coping strategies include follow a normal daily routine as much as possible rest, exercise, and eat properly. Spend time with loved ones and talk about getting help. Experts also recommend doing something positive. It's the friends call. It's amazing. The outpouring of help is just amazing. Little steps on the road to recovery. Cristian Benavides, CBS News, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So there are mental health consequences of single disasters. And that is mild stress, insomnia, as well as high risk coping behavior. This caused a big trigger in relapse. And there are mental illnesses associated with natural disasters, anxiety, depression, suicide, but PTSD is number one. So what I wanted to just share with you is that American Psychiatric Association did acknowledge this thing that said, you know, there, there is such a thing as weather-related post-traumatic stress disorder. Children are the most vulnerable to it. They continue to have trauma-related symptoms. And some of the factors are disruptions in their routine. You know, we didn't have school for a while. Separation from caregivers because they had to be evacuated and displaced. Parental stress can cause a lot of trauma-related symptoms to the kids. Because even if you are trying so hard to protect them from the negative energy, the kids can feel it. The kids, uh, they're very attuned to it. The good news is they are resilient. Their reaction to disasters may resolve over time, but they should be monitored for if they may have long-term effects of the chronic stress happening. I mean, what is it? Ian was 2022. People are still struggling, trying to even get their house fixed, fighting with the insurance companies. So these are the things we need to keep an eye on in the kids because the kids being displaced because they no longer have a house, that's still pretty stressful. They may have to be in a new school district. First responders are really increased risk for mental health issues. Why? If they lived in Florida, not only are they a first responder, but they're a victim. But they're expected to go out there and provide care for the public. While in their minds, they're like, oh my gosh, my house, my family. Do I even have a home to go back to? So they have to like put that in a box. And exposure to injury or death, whether it's the first responder or watching what happens, increases the negative impact in their mental health. So what are the um, PTSD risk factors? Well, it depends on the severity of the exposure as well as gender. Females are more prone to it than men. The family unit, you know, is it good? Is it not good? As well as age, the prevalence gets higher, but then the closer you are to 60, um, it does get better. And I think a lot has to do with, you know, just maturity, maybe. Uh, you've seen, you've been there, done that, you've seen it. What are the poor risk factors uh, for recovery from PTSD? 
Well, people you know, who haven't been functioning well before the disaster, if they have no experience dealing with disasters, and they've, de they've been dealing with other stress, they didn't have a lot of self-esteem, and they think they're uncared for by others, and um, they have little control over what hap what's happening to them, and they lack the capacity to manage stress. If you've already had these issues, uh, you're more prone to PTSD. The worst outcomes come when uh, you're dealing with bereavement, family, or loved one that passed away from the disaster. If um, you're injured yourself or even your loved one, your life was threatened during the disaster, the hurricane. People were scared for their lives. Their, their houses were being uh, torn apart while they're trying to just like pray that they're gonna survive this thing. The feeling of panic and horror during the disaster makes you have a worse outcome for PTSD. Being separated from your loved ones, they may have had to go elsewhere to be safe, where some people were had to were forced to stay wherever they were. Um, I had to stay in um, the hospital at Park Royal while my daughter was uh, in the house, no lights on and you know power off, and I, I was just thinking about just worried about that constantly. Thank God everybody was okay, but you know, not being able to be together is um, stressful enough. And of course, yeah, great loss of property. Um, I think this is Fort Myers, I think. So, um, you know, people are still rebuilding and continue to rebuild. It's gonna take decades. And of course, displacement, losing your home. You're not where you are. Being away from your comfort zone um, makes it a worse outcome with people with PTSD. But, you know, I, I don't wanna give you all kinds of like, uh, you know, um, negative um, news. There are people that can overcome PTSD and that is in the human resilience. Um, these help survivors recover from disaster and they, they can move on without having severe long lasting mental health issues. And some of the factors that will increase resilience after a disaster, these are the people that are problem solvers. They um, have a sense of being understood and accepted being allowed to share their trauma experience with others can increase your resilience and being able to normalize these feelings that you know having anxiety with triggers you know it's not abnormal this is all normal for anybody who may have gone through a disaster and having coping skills you know resilience does give better mental health outcomes and one is coping confidence when i say that that means you believe in yourself that you know you can get through it, you can do it. Hope, hope comes in different forms. Having a positive attitude, confidence in yourself, the belief that things will work out, belief that um, there are people out there acting your behalf to help you. Your belief in God, in whatever um, your spirituality is based or religion is based, just knowing that there is a higher power above you can give you hope. You know, you can't say, hey, you know, like, um, if you have survived all of this, you know, it's say that, you know, I'm good. I, I, I was lucky and I appreciate that. And if you have access to resources, housing, finances, so forth, that is a good thing to have to get also give you hope. So what I wanted to just discuss in the last part is that PTSD has a chemical connection. This is a busy slide, but I wanted to just show that which, you know, acute psychological stress throws this cascade of events in this adrenalinergic signaling, meaning the fight or flight, and that will result in releasing of cytokines, interleukin-6, to promote the fight or flight reaction, leading to mood anxiety disorders. They have studied that PTSD does increase these inflammation markers, and what are those? The most common one that I look at is C-reactive protein. That is non-specific, that it does not say where 
uh, the stress or what's causing that C-reactive protein to come up. But with academics, they do things like interleukin 1 and 6, as well as tumor necrosis factor. We could talk all about these markers all day, but the point is there is a chemical basis for people that have gone through stress, trauma, and people that have developed post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to still, you know, kind of blow your mind a little bit. These markers are found in the brain, but guess what? In PTSD and traumatic brain injury, they found the same chemical markers. So whether it is psychologic stress, whether it is physical stress with a brain injury, it causes the same chemical reaction. But there's more. You can find this in depression, anxiety, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, meaning, you know, these people are, you know, they have to have things a certain way or life is not good and they keep redoing it. And uh, there's a difference between obsessive compulsive behavior and disorder. The disorder really, really gets in the way of people's functioning. Schizophrenia. You can find inflammation markers in schizophrenia. And the rate limiting step is you can't see it, but as you can see the, um, the yellow here, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor. They are all present in the brain in these mental illness syndromes. Let's talk about PTSD. The treatment is really the psychotherapy of choice is um, EMDR. There's others, but that's what everybody knows. And it's a, a specialized form of therapy. You have to be certified in it. What it does, it causes the restructuring of the brain and it causes rewiring to occur, just therapy alone. And then it decreases the activation of strong emotions in response to a traumatic memory. And EEG has shown weakening of this connection between the fear and a traumatic experience. Therapy alone can help change the brain, as you can see in what um, they've done studies with EMDR. Anti-inflammatories, you know, supplements and medications. And medications really for PTSD is just insomnia, to treat the insomnia, anxiety, depression, and nightmares. But I wanted to just relate to you though, there is a 30% resistance in all these components. This was found in the treatment for PTSD in military and veteran population. 50% don't respond to therapy, 40% don't respond to medications alone. So you have to combine. But the problem is, what do you do with the rest of them? So we have to focus on the organ of interest. When it comes to mental illness, it is basically multifactorial. Genetics, trauma, environmental, nutrition, and medical status. And we have to focus on trying to get the brain healthy. And my approach is integrative. You come to me and I'm gonna listen to, how are you eating, how are you sleeping, what are your relationships like? What trauma have you been through? And I ask them, you know, what's your lifestyle? I will, you know, focus on, hey, stop putting bad things in your body. Processed foods, sugar. You know, patients come, you know, they say like, yeah, I love my sugar, I feel better. But like, you know, that's just like defeating the purpose. Avoiding toxic substances. No alcohol, no drugs, very bad for the brain. Exercise depending on what kind of genetics you are, I will promote a certain kind of exercise. Sleep can do amazing for your mental health. It will also alter the brain for the better. And of course, therapy, I would recommend that. And the most popular one as said is EMDR, cognitive behavioral therapy and grounding. Then I will say, hey, you know, maybe you need supplements right now. Maybe, definitely you need supplements and as well as maybe you need medications. This is the last slide. I just wanted to just reiterate to you how I approach people with mental health. I don't just listen to the symptoms and here's your medicine. I start with genetics. I want to know what's wrong. I want to know what you're born with. Are you capable of making your own neurotransmitters or are you capable of regenerating after a brain injury? Or how much dopamine are you metabolizing, a lot or not enough? Then I use all the data along with the labs to determine first, what are the right things when it comes to 
even just supplements before going to medicines. And talk about TMS, TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Unfortunately, not all insurances cover it. Some insurances do, but they give us a hard time. Medicaid, as I said, does not cover it. And as you know, these are the highest population at risk for uh, mental health and substance use disorders. I'm not gonna talk about this right now, but hormones do play a factor in this. This is what I've come to call the Brainwell program in my office. If you wanna know more about it, you know, talk to me or just go to our website. But this is how I approach mental health. Don't come to me because you want a pill or if you think I'm gonna find your, your magic pill. You also have to take your responsibility in being motivated to get the right kind of help and also take initiative to take care of yourself too. Because it's not just a pill, it's not the responsibility all in the doctor, but I'm willing to help anyone that is willing to go on this journey with me because every journey is different.